This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, so I want to give you a little bit of context um, for the location of these trials. So Delaware is located there in the southern part of the Mid-Atlantic region. And we have six to 8,000 acres of snap beans planted in the state every year. The end use of those is both for processing and fresh market. And planting starts at the end of April and continues uh, up until August with harvest starting in July and up until frost around October 20th. The soils in this area are primarily sandy loams or loamy sands, so quite light and well-drained most of the time. Um, because our soils are so light, all of our production is irrigated uh, with overhead uh, pivot irrigation in most cases. Uh, sometimes we do have problems with water logging and root rots. Um, we have pretty high water tables. We also have uh, uh, not so much in the way of topography. So uh, we get low areas in fields that don't drain. Um, so we do have some root uh, disease issues. And we do have annual problems with heat stress, especially in plantings that went in in May and June, and then um, are subject to high temperatures in June and July when they are flowering. So I'm going to start out by talking uh, more about the physiology of heat stress in snap beans. The temperatures that we're most concerned about are the nighttime temperatures. Um, and the chart that's uh, on the slide that I'm showing you are the daily max and min temperatures for July 2020. So this was in the flowering period of one of our 2020 trials that was planted on June 9th. And um, sort of the optimal nighttime temperature uh, for snap beans is 65 degrees. And we start uh, seeing quality and yield loss at 68 degrees at night. So you can see that uh, many daytime minimum temperatures are above that threshold of 68 degrees Fahrenheit in this time period. And uh, harvest for this trial began on July 27th and flowering was around July 13th. Um, the most susceptible growth stage to high temperatures for snap beans is in the 10 days prior to flower opening and then during early flowering. So that is when the flowers and the flower buds, so the flowers that are forming, can be damaged by the high nighttime temperatures. So the, this particular planting, there were a fair number of nights above the 68 degree threshold in that time period when the plants are gonna be susceptible to damage from heat stress. You see that right after flowering began, there was a period of few days with low nighttime temperatures, but that probably didn't help uh, this planting out so much, especially once we actually looked at the data, it was clear that they had been exposed to a lot of heat stress. And then um, you'll see that later on, closer to harvest, there were some very high nighttime temperatures, but those were also probably not so impactful in terms of yield and quality. What was really impacting this planting was that period right before flowering began. So the damage that is caused by heat stress is damage to flower structures. And high night temperatures cause the anthers to not open up and release their pollen. So uh, in the picture up here, where you see those anthers with all the little round things inside, those are the pollen grains, and those are supposed to not be in the anthers anymore. They're supposed to have been released onto the stigma 
which is that sort of shiny part of uh, the flower that you see there. And they should be sticking on there, germinating, growing a pollen tube down and fertilizing the egg cell to make a seed. However, they can't do that when the pollen grains stay inside the anthers. On the right side of this slide, you can see uh, an image of some anthers that have opened up and released their pollen. These are anthers from a plant that was not heat stressed. And so there's not very many pollen grains left in the anthers. Instead, they have all ended up on the style and stigma of the flower where they can do their job of pollinating. The other thing that happens with high night temperatures, in addition to the pollen not ending up on the style and stigma, sometimes the pollen that does end up there is lower quality, so it is less likely to germinate and form a pollen tube and cause fertilization. So again, the result is that you have fewer seeds, you have uh, misshapen pods. Because of those fewer seeds, you might not have pods setting or at all. Um, some pods that set might uh, or board or fall off. Um, and if you aren't setting pods at all, you may have delayed harvest. If you have some pods set and then um, a period of high temperatures, you may have a split set, which really makes people crazy when it comes to harvest time. So I'm going to show you a couple of different varieties and sort of the way that they have responded to heat stress differently, but all uh, susceptible. So uh, for this particular variety, it has set a few pods early, but you can see that they are all short. They have only one or two seeds set in them, maybe three, but that's not sufficient to form a good sized pod. And, um, and then uh, these plants, after a period of time, have not set any additional pods they're still flowering because they have not been able to, to set pods because of heat stress. Here's another variety. Some varieties will set pods even though the embryos, there are no embryos because the eggs have not been fertilized. And those pods often look like these little um, hook shaped pin pods. There are no seeds forming inside of there and those pods will fall off most likely, um, would certainly not make a marketable snapping. And uh, then there are some varieties. This is Cabris, which is uh, one of the standard varieties grown in Delaware. This variety tends to set a fair number of pods under heat stress, but many of them are misshapen um, and are probably going to be graded as culls. So these pictures are illustrating the importance of uh, quality grading when evaluating varieties for heat tolerance. So at the top are two varieties that have been very heat tolerant in many of our trials, PV857 and Bridger. And at the bottom are two varieties that, have, uh, that are quite heat susceptible, Caprice and Affirmed. So uh, for each of the varieties, it's a 300 gram sample of pods that has been graded into the fancy uh, number one and call categories. And um, you'll see that for PV857 and Bridger, most of the pods are ending up in the fancy and number one categories and not so many pods in the call categories. Whereas for Caprice and Affirmed, most of the pods are in the call category. So um, as I have been evaluating varieties for heat tolerance, uh, this grading process has been a part of, an important part of evaluating them, not just looking at total yield. You can um, certainly some varieties just don't produce very many pods at all, but others produce a lot of pods, but they're calls. Okay. So I'm going to show you two charts um, from one from the 2020 trials and one from the 2021 trials in both years had two plantings of uh, many round potted snap bean varieties. 
in 2020, the early trial was planted June 9th. That was the trial for which I showed you some weather data earlier that it was harvested uh, starting July 27th through August 3rd. And this trial was exposed to a lot of heat stress in the early part of July during flowering. Then uh, that same year, we had a late trial that was planted July 15th. So this is more towards the end of our um, production period. And this was meant to be a low stress trial. And indeed it was a low stress trial. So in this chart, the orange and gray bars are the early trial that was heat stressed and the blue and gray bars are the later trial, which was not heat stressed. You can see that overall um, yields were much higher in the later trial that was not stressed. Um, but some of the varieties did produce higher yields or decent yields, I should say, in the trial that was heat stressed. The colored parts of the bars are the marketable yield and the gray parts are the cold yield. Um, the highest yielding varieties in the heat stress trial were PV857 and Bridger. Um, PV857 and Bridger are two varieties I mentioned already. Um, they are, PV857 is a variety that has been in our trials um, for many years um, and has looked good in the heat stress trials. And Bridger is a variety that was in the 2020 and the 2021 trials and looked good as far as um, its heat stress tolerance in both of our heat stress trials in those years. Um, you can see that there are many other varieties in the, these trials and in the late trial, um, there were quite a few varieties that outperformed PV857 and Bridger, the very heat tolerant varieties. So um, they uh, were, were definitely not the highest yielding varieties when they weren't stressed, but under heat stress, they were had significantly higher marketable yields than all of the other varieties. And this is a similar chart for our 2021 trials. Um, so again, in this case, the early planted trial um, which was planted June 9th, or sorry, June 2nd, um, and harvested at the end of July, was exposed to heat stress. The late later planted trial, which was actually also supposed to be a heat stress trial, was planted June 16th. It did not end up being impacted by heat stress. Instead, it was uh, severely impacted by um, pythium. Uh, root rot, the plants came up, we had uh, very good stands, and then we had a really sizable rain event that um, made the field very wet for quite a while, and um, we had a lot of plants die um, at sort of the first trifoliate leaf stage uh, in this trial, and what we isolated from the roots, or at least what the plant pathologists isolated from the roots was pythium. So, we think that's what did this in later on when we were harvesting. We saw some um, pod rot from Pythium as well in this field. So uh, varieties that had decent yields in the second trial, the blue and gray bars, those are varieties that had some root disease tolerance. So in the heat stress trial, the highest yielding varieties were Bridger, PV857, and Jaguar. Jaguar was a variety that was new to the trials this year. Um, those three varieties had significantly higher marketable yield than all of the other varieties in the trial, in the heat, in the heat stress trial. And um, I also wanted to highlight uh, HMX 0175722, which is apparently been named bird and will be available at some point in the future, the not too distant future, I'm told. Um, so that variety was also in the 2020 trials. It, it seems to be okay in terms of heat tolerance, but it was the highest yielding variety 
in uh, the second trial that was exposed to a lot of root disease. Um, that variety seems to have an awful lot of root disease tolerance, or at least apithia, um, which is what we had in this situation. So I'm just going to review some of the heat tolerant varieties um, and mention uh, the flat potted uh, trials we've done too. So PV857 is a variety that has certainly shown a lot of heat tolerance in the trials we've conducted in the past. It's a three to four sieve size variety. Bridger is slightly larger size B and four to five sieve size. And it was trialed in 2020 and 2021 and has similar level of heat tolerance to PV857. Jaguar was only trialed in 2021, but in that heat stress trial, it performed very well um, and had significantly higher yield um, than other varieties in the trial, along with PV857 and Bridger. And Bird, I mentioned, is a variety that seems to have um, okay heat tolerance, but also a fair amount of root disease resistance. I have also trialed flat potted snap beans in 2019 and 2021. Um, Usambara is the variety that seems to have the most heat tolerance among the flat potted varieties that I have looked at. And uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that I've had a lot of help from uh, some young people over the years of this, these trials uh, from 2017 to 2021 to get these uh, beans picked and graded. And these are photos of some of them. The variety trial reports from each year are available on our website if you uh, Google search Delaware Vegetable Variety Trials, you'll find our variety trials page and the snap bean variety trial results are on that page. The 2021 trial report is completed, but it hasn't been posted yet. So hopefully it will be up there soon. All right, and that is the end of my presentation. I guess I can take any questions. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm, I'm going to start off with a question. Um, since it's the nighttime temperatures that are the problem, have there been any growers down there that have tried irrigating at night? And I know that's probably one of the worst things you can do from a disease standpoint, but has anybody tried to do that to reduce the temperature? So um, we tried an experiment uh, in 2020 where we were trying that with lima beans and um, we were not really able to decrease the temperature in the field um, sufficiently to have the effect that we were hoping. Um, we were also obviously really concerned about potential disease problems. That is something that we continue to um, think about as far as whether we could use a center pivot irrigation systems to cool fields at night, but we, um, yeah, and I don't know of any growers that have tried it. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Emily? Emily, do you know how much this carries over to other types of beans? If this is just a snap bean thing or if you're also impacting limas and flat pods and dry beans? Okay, so um, since snap beans and like dry, Phaseolus vulgaris dry beans um, are the same species, the impact is the same. So is this, and um, Lima beans are a different species, but still phaseolus, and it is basically the same effects. The, I would say the temperature thresholds are maybe a little higher for lima beans. Generally say about 70 degrees is when we start seeing problems in lima beans, especially baby limas, the larger seeded Lima beans, so Ford hook types or the larger seeded pole types are more heat sensitive than baby limas. Sure. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you know, when I, when I see the pictures and, and your summary, it makes us all think about what we're seeing in the fields here as well. And at 60, that, that threshold is, uh, is 
is rather scary because we have many nights even here in upstate New York that we don't get below that. So, so I'll be your speaker for the next 25 minutes. And I also want to introduce uh, Masi, who's a research associate in my laboratory. She's been with me for the past eight years, has really helped a lot as we put this presentation together. Uh, we're somewhat reviewing the first 20 years of my career at Cornell started in the 80s and 90s, and you'll see references going into the early 2000s and some of the people that we've worked with, including Steve, uh, along the way with, with looking at snap beans as it's such an important uh, crop for us here in New York State. I want to thank Julie and Steve for, for putting this together and reaching out to invite me along with some of the other speakers. And I really, really enjoyed uh, the first speaker and, and uh, the, some of the things going on there with the, with the heat stress. So, so really, really good presentation there, kudos. So what I want to do is really kind of talk about several factors, start off with seed factors that affect germination and stand establishment, then go into the field factors, and then try to tie the seed and the field factors as affects stain establishment, but actually take this all the way to what is the yield potential as well. So we kind of start off with this uh, kind of an encyclopedia uh, definitions of bean seeds going to the seed lane. Rather than just looking at the bean as just a living entity, our goal is for every sown seed to germinate, emerge uniformly in the field, and then take all the way out to its maximum yield potential. So how is this going to happen? The first thing you need to do is start off with high quality seeds. Looking at the figure on the right is kind of a generalized uh, depiction of what's going on after seeds are produced on the mother plant till the time that they're planted. There's that storage period, that time between uh, seed harvest and then sowing, and then what events are occurring on. At the whole plant level, we're looking at a decline in germination with the blue line where the seeds can maintain the germination and then kind of drop off. But we're seeing earlier events going on with the decline in the seed vigor. And so that's really important, especially as we talk about stress and the effect of stress on germination. So along with uh, seed aging that can occur, the effect of decline, we know that moisture content is very important, uh, particular to the snap beans. This is also true of dry beans. And if you're working with, and if you, you plant soybeans, this is also important for soybeans. But this is our moisture meter uh, in our laboratory. It's a non-destructive technique. Also, the New York State Seed Testing Laboratory, now based in Albany, also does this on a routine basis. Let's focus on the, the graph. And, and we've got lots of graphs and tables where I try to walk everybody through so you can kind of see what the main, the main talking points are that I'm trying to make. So this relationship here, we call a moisture isotherm. Basically, if you store seeds, and we're seeing over this wide range of relative humidities, the seeds can either take up or lose moisture, and they're going to have a corresponding seed moisture content. This is basically the, the moisture content of the seeds as you would open up the bag. So on the upper part, you can see the storage losses increase. In other words, the seeds age faster in storage. And again, that's true of, of all seeds as they will age faster as we increase temperature, but also as we increase moisture content. Bean seeds are also very susceptible to mechanical damage, handling damage. This is a physical damage and also hydration injury, which we call chilling injury or imbibitional chilling injury. So we have two contrasting. So the seed companies are aware of this, the processing, the large companies, and they try to, you know, we try to find the kind of the sweet spot of having the seed moisture content uh, kind of as an intermediate between these. But let's look further as we uh, look at some of the data from these type of work. Uh, so the things that we've done, just a lot of times when we're in the laboratory, we want to do a rapid aging test. So here we're looking at in the left-hand side, just a six week period by putting seeds at warm degrees, 40 degrees centigrade is over hundred degrees Fahrenheit with high moisture content. So that aging occurs very rapidly. 
but you say, well, that, that's not really realistic for the way we're storing seeds. But if you're storing seeds, even at lower temperatures and lower moisture contents, if you have carryover seeds for a year's time, these same relationships are going to occur as the decline in germination. The square boxes are what we call abnormal seedlings. So the seeds sprout, but they don't grow normally. And then eventually everything is dead. So that is kind of the, 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 the chorus here, just abbreviated in time, but the same would play out under less stressful situations in the storage environment. Let's look at the figure on the right-hand side is here we're looking at the early phases, the decline in vigor. So one of the very first symptoms of the vigor loss, the seeds start to germinate slower. You can see uh, the time course here. This is not with beans. This is with another vegetable crop. But the seeds are starting to germinate slower. And if we went further in aging, then there'd also be a decline in the percentage of seeds that do germinate. Uh, again, we're on the theme of moisture content and the importance of moisture content. Uh, Mike Dixon was a plant breeder. This is before Griff. Mike had tremendous insights, understanding the role and the impact that plant breeding could have on a bean as far as their germination and stand establishment occurs, and especially with regards to stress. One of the things, as I mentioned, is bean sides are very susceptible to the mechanical damage. So, being, uh, so Mike set up this uh, stress test, which is basically, a, as you can see, a, a, a stove pipe onto seeds onto a steel plate. It's a very good screening technique he, he used. He also did work with, with heat tolerance too. So again, a lot of that stuff tends to be forgotten, but a lot of classic work was done here at Geneva on breeding for stress tolerance. I want to show you the figure on the right is after those seeds get damaged, after they get dropped, we're looking at an x-ray and I was on sabbatic in Oregon State. Uh, this goes back to 1990 when I did some of this work. They had a nice x-ray facility there for doing seed quality work. And you can see those hairline cracks uh, in the seeds. The same thing as to say if you, 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 you fell and you broke your arm or your wrist and you can see hairline fracts with an x-ray, we can pick those up. Those damages to the cotyledons, again, are gonna express themselves during the germination and tremendously weaken the seedling. Also along with the lines with the moisture content, the particular low moisture content is their sensitivity to cold temperatures, chilling temperatures. We had developed a, a cold stress test. You can see the beans on the left. And here we're looking at the same variety, the same line. And all we've done is changed the initial moisture content of that seed. So the table in, in the purple on the right-hand side, again, same variety, same seed line. The only thing that was different is we changed the initial seed moisture content to a low moisture, 8%, or a high moisture, 12%. The warm germination, which is your standard germination test, doesn't really show too much. So an ideal condition, not too much difference. But now when we put them in that chilling stress, now we see a very large difference where those low moisture content are really getting injured. Also, the seeds that were mechanically dropped to induce the physical damage, uh, again, we're seeing them the low moisture content seeds. And then finally to field emergence and field emergence also under a cold, wet planting situation in the spring also shows the effect of that uh, moisture content and particularly the low moisture content of having a very negative effect on the stand establishment potential. So those are the seed related factors. Now we're gonna move into the soil environment, uh, those field factors. So at the experiment station at the vegetable, where we used to call the old vegetable crops research farm, uh, I was able to obtain data. The soil temperatures are recorded on a daily basis, the minimum and maximum. This is under bare soil at the two inch planting depth. So we're looking at an average over a nine year period. In blue is the maximum soil temperature, again, recorded in, in that date time. The minimum, it'd be the coldest temperature. So we see quite a diurnal, in other words, a, a daily fluctuation in soil temperatures at that two inch depth. 
Why is this important? This is important to snap beans. It's important to vessels. It's important to our friends working in fruits, to all crops, because this is basically is this, the soil environment that the plants are going to be exposed to. Why it's important to us in snap beans is that we try to plant early and try to get earlier in the season, especially as those low soil temperatures, what is going to be the effect on the germination? What stress is going to be imposed on the time for the seeds to germinate? So here we're, we have data that we've taken out of the literature. So there's different factors that affect the time for a bean seed or really any vegetable crop seed to germinate. One is called the base temperature. So in the case of base temperature means if you go below that temperature, the seeds are not progressing uh, to them being able to germinate. So that's kind of the lower limit. Then the other is the growing degree days, which is like a heat sum unit uh, that's used so we can calculate this. Showing data from two different sources and some of the data where it overlaps, you see quite good agreement. As you'd expect, under warmer soil temperatures, seeds germinate very rapidly, they kind of really just jump out of the ground there in the warm soil temperatures above say 75 degrees. But it is that soil temperature, and this is now an average soil temperature. This is not showing that, that day-night fluctuation, but a constant temperature. But as we cool the soil, as it gets lower and lower, now look at we're out to 14 days, past 21 days, if you're at a temperature, say a soil temperature, down to 55 degrees. So, so essentially that jump you're trying to get if you're trying to plant early can definitely be offset by that extra period of time that's gonna take for emergence to occur. Another stress is water stress. And everybody that grows crops is well familiar with water stress. And it really can be in two forms. One is water stress in the form of a drought stress. Now I didn't have data uh, for you on bean seeds. This happens to be on hemp. But it really doesn't matter because it shows the generalized response of seed germination as we decrease the water availability. We don't have to get fancy with the units, these MPA, the megapascals, but just knowing that we're going to zero means pure water and that we're getting less water available. Let's look at the very profound effect that has on the germination time course. So the seeds would germinate very rapidly if water is available, but then as less and less water available, we're starting to see a slowdown in the germination and then eventually a reduction in those seeds that can germinate. So essentially this is again, a, a major environmental stress as the water stress as a drought would occur. Now, if we went further, if we kept on getting even drier, the seeds are not going to sprout at all in the ground. They'll just sit there. They're going to sit there and wait for a rain or irrigation or some supplemental change in the soil moisture content for them to germinate. So the, the seeds have not perished. The other extreme of anything uh, too much of a good thing is a very wet soil condition. And we can see some of the equipment that we had here, our lab instrumentation to measure the oxygen availability, the soil oxygen diffusion rate uh, that we can do in the laboratory so we can kind of quantify things. So too much water is excluding the oxygen from moving through the soil. Seeds, when they germinate, are respiring. They're just like you and I, we need to breathe. The seeds also need to respire. And once you can see that graph on the right, it's a little bit tricky, but look at the bottom axis, the soil oxygen fusion rate. And then the red line is the percent seedling emergence. At high oxygen diffusion, good soil, oxygen movement, we see a very high percentage germination. But then we get to a critical point where there's really a crash and the seeds are able to germinate. So once we get down below around about 80 uh, on that scale, then we see a very large drop in the germination. Unlike the drought stress where the seeds are gonna sit there, these seeds are gonna die. They're gonna sit there and rot and because there's too much oxygen available. So this is kind of a, of a point of no return if you run into this particular scenario. The last of the physical stresses is a soil crust. Again, from our, our research farm at, at Geneva, you have a certain amount of a, of a clay, a heavier soil, 
Generally, our soils have low organic matter. So this is uh, just showing the, the nature of that physical crust. How do these soil crusts form? You have a time from the time of planting the seeds till the time they emerge. That's a critical period. That's why the temperature is important. You want that time period from the time of sowing, from planting to emergence to be short so the seeds can get up out of the ground and going. What we're seeing here is a sequence of event with rain, raindrop intensity. The duration of the raindrop is breaking down the soil structure, breaking down the soil aggregates. So those fine particles are starting to move to the top. And then the drying, the sun and wind, we're getting a drying. And so basically that's where you get that physical barrier. So the seeds have germinated, they've sprouted, but they're not able to physically emerge. And obviously this can have a dramatic effect on delaying and reducing the percent stand establishment. Okay, we're gonna change now into looking at what, what is the effect now we have a given seed lot. The seed lot is going to have both high quality seeds, but there's always, you know, the germination is not going to be 100% on that seed lot. There's going to be some low vigor seeds also present in that seed lot. So what is the consequence there when we're looking at the seedling emergence, the rate of the seedling emergence out in the field situation? So we asked this question, again, we're going back into the 90s. Look at the people there on the right, Hugh Price, Bob Becker, Jim Ballerstein. Uh, this is before Stephen even arrived on the scene. David was uh, my research technician at the time. So we asked these really kind of fundamental questions about how important is these seeds to germinate and emerge uniformly. So what we did is we took the seedlings, planted just the bag of seeds, particular seed lot, try to get a target distance between them about two inches apart between the seedlings. Then as the seedlings were coming up, we tagged the seedlings, put a little, little colored tag on them. If they were the fastest to germinate, we designated those as the early to emerge. There's the medium, you can see just emerged, just getting to the first true leaf stage. And then there's the late, which have come up. You see the cotyledon still, but well behind the other ones. So now we take these three groups, tagged early, medium, and late, grow them all the way till the harvest maturity, harvest those by group, early, medium, and late, and then take that all the way for the yield data. So let's look at the data. We had two years that we did this. 1993 was a very cold and wet soil situation. I know these varieties have all come and gone. Bush Blue Lake 47, uh, most of you don't even remember what that variety was. But I don't think it's really that important. Again, I don't know if our newer varieties we're planting today, but I suspect the response that we're looking at here would translate over to the varieties today. Again, I'm speculating here at this point. But let's look at the data way back from 93 when we did this study, tag the early, the medium, and the late, okay? And then we said, well, boy, let's just repeat this study. We did this in 1994. 1994 was a very warm spring, very warm soil temperatures, ideal conditions. So you can see they literally jumped out of the ground and coming up much sooner. So under that 1993 and that cold, we're seeing an emergence, a spread of over seven days, where in the 94, just a few days that is going on there, okay? Now let's look at the yield data, starting off with the 93 cold, wet stress. Again, taking as an emergence group, those that were early, the medium and late. Projecting now in yield as ton per acres, we can see that the yield is largely being carried by those that are early to emerge. A drop off with the medium and then the late are much lower, much less yield potential. So what is going on here is those late to emerge are, are somewhat functional weeds. They're really competing with those fast to emerge and really taking away, you know, we're gonna be hearing from Lynn about weeds, but we also have the crop itself can act somewhat as a weed as it's competing against the main crop for the carrying the yield potential. 
We also did sizing of the pods, the twos, threes, and fours, the smaller size. And as you would expect, the early to mature also had earlier harvest. So we see a change there to a higher percentage of the larger sieve size, the fives and sixes. Okay, let's look at the 94. This Let's look at the also the, the old Bush Blue Lake 47. So now we're not seeing the distinction between the early and, and medium as far as the statistics is concerned with yield. Remember, they only come up about a day or so apart from each other. However, the late is significantly less. And probably what's going on here, just like in any seed lot, there's going to be low vigor seeds present in that seed lot. And those low vigor seeds are also going to have less yield potential. And again, they're also competing against the early. So it's kind of a double whammy. Poor quality seeds, low vigor seeds within the seed lot and also the competition against those that are fast to emerge. I just wanna summarize two other studies here and then I'll show you a bunch of tables and figures, but just kind of give you the highlights. Uh, again, this is when, when Steve was on board with us at this point, working with us and also with, with Ellen Cherko who is in the seed testing laboratory. So our, our first study was, is many of the growers were purchasing seeds, they had a situation with carryover seeds. In other words, you purchase the, the seeds for this year, you don't plant them this year, you carry over the seeds in the bag, in the barn until the next year. So we simulated that carryover seed with a very mild kind of a seed aging technique to simulate what happened over one year's time to do that in a month or two. Those carryover seeds had lower percent lab germination. We would expect that than the non-age seed lot. However, that loss in lab germination was also directly related to the reduction in field emergence, but also decreased yield. So now we're seeing the linkage that starting off with that high quality seed is very important and it carries through not just to the stain establishment, but also to the yield potential. Uh, Steve and I came back with a study, again, varieties come and go. But I think we can still learn some things here. We had four seed lots of high style. One very high quality seed lot with 94% germ. Three medium, what I'm calling from 78 to 80% germ. All these would meet federal standards uh, for germination of, of snap beans. Now the high quality seed lot had greater field emergence than the other three seed lots. Again, we'd kind of expect that. But the yield from that high quality, the 94% germination was greater in a range from about 12 to 18% than the other three seed lots. So again, starting off with a high quality seed. So I just want to kind of, I know I've hit a lot of things and I do have a summary that I've, I've uh, turned in. So you have a, a written copy of, of to follow this. There's seed factors, percent germination. Start with high quality seeds. If you learn nothing else, from this presentation, start with high quality, get good quality seeds to begin with. Moisture content in particular in beans, really important. Increasing moisture content, the seeds will, will decline faster in storage, but decreased moisture content starts to increase their susceptibility to the handling problems, the hydration, the chilling entry problems. Field factors are obvious with soil temperature, stress occurs at, at, as we lower that soil temperature. And soil water content, of course, the water is necessary for germination, but stress occurs with either too much or too little. We saw the consequences of soil crusting. But that uniformity of seedling emergence is linked to yield. And so again, getting back to the theme, the high quality seeds have the potential for the greater stands, but also greater yield potential. So I wanna thank everybody for your attention. I think we have a minute or two for, for questions. Thank you, Alan. It was fun to go back and uh, relive some of those things and, and with some of the issues that we still have. So I'm gonna open it up to see if there's any questions here for, for people. I think, I, again, I know it's a lot in a short period of time. And again, you're seeing 20 years of my professional life flash before your eyes in 25 minutes. But I think if you go back, once the summary uh, becomes available to you, you have the same information that you can read through and kind of help digest it a little bit better. Thank you. Yeah, we will get that summary out. I guess one question for you, Alan, is, is and it goes right along with what we we're seeing here in your data, is you know, sometimes we'll visit a, 
field, growers field, and depending on the seed or the planter that they're using, uh, their depth may be a little bit off and there can be some variability there. And that gets right back into what you were showing that it, then you might have emergence differences. And, and so just the putting of the seed in the field can have a huge difference too, right? That's a really good point, Stephen. And that's one that we, we, we you know, we, we try to look at things kind of carefully at the time, but that's one we, we did not look at, but something we, we could kind of still do, uh, especially with some of the, the varieties we're growing today. But I think kind of the underlying story from everything we've done is anything that's going to uh, upset or get a broader distribution, the lack of uniformity of emergence, we're going to see that changing. So if the depth of planting, uh, is going to increase that spread of the emergence time, the time for the seedlings to come out of the ground, we're going to also see those same type of trends is what I would predict. Great. So first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, Liz Maloney, my technician, um, who uh, is really responsible for getting all of our trials in the ground. And I also want to thank uh, and acknowledge Thierry Basison at Rutgers, Dwight Ligenfelter at Penn State, and Mark Van Gessel, because uh, the projects that I'm going to talk about in today's talk, we all did um, together with some collaborative research. So I want to talk about um, herbicides and the timing that herbicides uh, come into contact with the crop and their impacts on snap bean injury and yield. So herbicides are obviously really uh, important for crop production in the United States. They're the most commonly applied uh, pesticides with respect to treated acres across all of our cropping systems, both agronomic and specialty. Now, they're effective for managing unwanted vegetation, which helps us uh, preserve our yields, but they can also cause unintended injury. Some of that is due to off-target movement, and some of that is due to applications that occur in the crop from registered herbicide materials. So first, for off-target movement. When we think off-target movement, the first thing that comes up is spray drift or maybe volatility. Spray drift being the movement of spray droplets during the application process. Whereas volatility is the change in state of a herbicide where it, it goes from a liquid to a gas, it vaporizes off of that surface and then causes damage. So we're gonna really probably primarily focus on spray drift and, and let's Let's face it, the, the, the gorilla in the room when we're talking about spray drift over the past couple of years has been dicamba. And dicamba tolerant crops were developed and commercialized because of herbicide resistance, um, particularly the development of glyphosate resistant weeds, which evolved in response to the development of glyphosate resistant crops. Um, but we know that oxins like dicamba can move off target and they can cause injury to sensitive crops and those can be non-engineered soybeans and cotton or they can be specialty crops like snap beans and snap beans are particularly sensitive to dicamba now dicamba use in soybeans is less prevalent in new york but that doesn't mean it's non-existent uh, these are pictures from a field from western new york in 2022 Again, dicamba drift may not be a common occurrence in New York, but it can and does happen. This, this uh, field happened to be actually a self-inflicted um, scenario where uh, a grower went around the, the edge of his field because he had horse weed slash mare's tail and treated it with dicamba and that dicamba moved off into uh, about five acres of the snapping crop causing damage. So with uh, the, you know, the rise in uh, dicamba use throughout the United States and with the increase in reported dicamba injury, Thierry Basilson at Rutgers and I uh, started a trial in 2020 to look at the impacts of low doses of dicamba on snapping injury and yield when they were applied at either the V2, the first trifoliate leaf stage or at first flower. And when we talk about low doses, we went down and looked at doses as low as one ten thousandth the field rate, the field rate being 22 ounces per acre. So this is our plant size at harvest. 
this as a percent of the check. So assume the check is 100 and everything is adjusted relative to that check. If the check's 100%, everything is adjusted down. And, and what we saw is that for dicamba treatments at the one five thousandth rate or higher, uh, we saw plant stunting. We saw growth inhibition at that V2 stage that, that lasted throughout the season and was visible at harvest timing. So we had injury and it, it manifest as, as distortions to leaves and stems, but it also manifest as growth inhibition and we could see this. Now, we didn't see it with applications made at first flower stage. Uh, in fact, we didn't see any appreciable differences in plant size at all. So if you were looking at these plants from a distance, you know, there would be nothing with respect to canopy development, you know, that would, would tip you off that there was some sort of damage occurring. However, what we did see is yield loss nonetheless. And so we saw yield loss associated with V2 application, but also the first flower application. So the V2 application was in, in, in associated with, again, the injury and the reductions in plant size that we saw. We saw the reductions in the yield, but we saw those reductions in the first flower, even though we didn't see smaller plants. And that's because what we had here was these applications, we had some distortions, but what it really did is it interfered with the development of flowers and pods and reduced our yields. So this, this movement of uh, off, you know, chemicals that um, are maybe applied in, in adjacent fields can have a significant impact on you know, snapping growth and development. And this can have a significant impact on the amount of yield that you can uh, achieve. Again, at our highest rates, you know, we're looking at a 97% yield loss, 85% yield loss. So these are substantial. Now there's in-crop applications. So applications that are made with herbicides that are registered for use in snap beans that can cause injury to snap beans themselves. And we're gonna talk about post-emergence herbicides and we're gonna talk about three of them, Bassigran, Reflex, and Raptor. Um, they're important herbicides. They're often used in combination with each other in part to manage weeds because they do have different spectrums of control uh, but also, uh, in the case of Raptor, um, wanting to tank mix it with Bassigran to reduce injury potential. Now, I do want to point out there's two asterisks on this, on this slide, and uh, we'll talk about this at um, a, later, a later presentation or timing, is that we do have resistance to uh, these um, active ingredients, to these herbicides. <laughs> So with Raptor, we do know that we have pigweeds in the state of New York that are resistant to ALS inhibiting herbicides. And with respect to the Bassigran, we're um, doing confirmatory studies right now with Kyle Brunharo at Penn State, is that we do have, appear to have certain populations in New York that, that are not responding to Bassigran. We have one population that we have survivors at even um, 12 pints per acre rate. So again, um, injury can sometimes come from applications made with registered herbicides within the field. Again, Raptor and Raptor plus Bassigran is, is a really good example of this. We tank mix Raptor and Bassigran to reduce injury potential. You can see the yellowing uh, from the Raptor applied by itself. This is a slide from Mark Van Gessel and you can see um, less injury on the Raptor plus Bassigran. Now, we do know that uh, when it comes to using our post-emergence herbicides, uh, there, there are timing restrictions or timing recommendations on the label about when they can be used. You know, some say the first trifoliate leaf stage, some say the second trifoliate leaf stage. So we know that we have to allow for plant growth and development to increase the safety potential of these products. We also know that if we don't have good pre-emergence herbicide activity at the start of the process, you know, at the start of when we plant, uh, say we don't get a pre-emergent herbicide activated, our weeds get up. And there's, there's kind of this, this uh, push-pull tug, you know, kind of going on here that as our crop is getting 
older and more developed uh, so we can achieve crop safety. Our weeds might be growing as well and our application timings being delayed means the weeds are taller and they're going to be less effective. The herbicides are gonna be less effective for controlling them. So uh, again, there's a risk of spraying early. You know, maybe wanting to go in as early as possible to control uh, the weeds, but there's also that potential for damage to the crop. Um, last year, we got um, some uh, questions some about splitting the difference. What if, like with Alan said, you have, you know, these timings where, um, you know, you don't get the, the weed emergence, you know, or you don't get uh, an equally merged stand. And now you have a stand that's at different growth stages, uh, but you need to go in for post-emergence weed management. Or what if you don't get your pre-emergence herbicide? You know, what kind of injury are we going to see if we go too early? You know, if it, you know, to make, uh, to get the effective weed control, what kind of crop damage could we possibly see on those plants that aren't as well established? Uh, so Mark Van Gessel, Dwight Ligenfelter, and I put in a trial in 2021 to specifically look at the timing of, of uh, herbicide applications, uh, Bassagran, Reflex, and Bassagran with Reflex or Raptor, and to look at what happens if we apply them at the cotyledon, the unifoliate, or the first trifoliate leaf stage. Uh, and this is uh, the snapping injury that we saw at, at two weeks after treatment. The herbicides are averaged over all of the timings, the application timings are averaged over all the herbicides. What we saw and what we're showing is we saw the majority of the injury with our basagran and reflex applications. And you know, we expected with the application timing that we would see the most with the cotyledon, you know, the next with the, the unifoliate stage and the least with the trifoliate. Uh, what we saw in our situation, our, our collective data was our, tri our unifoliate stage had the most injury. There's a reason why for this, and this is gonna get into why we just can't think about the herbicides and the crops alone. Uh, this is the data, this is a comparison of the data that Mark captured at the unifoliate stage two weeks after treatment in Delaware and the data that I captured in New York. And you can see there's a real difference in the unifoliate um, timing and the amount of injury that we saw where we saw up to 70, 75% injury in our basogram plus reflex 40 to 60% injury with reflex and basogram plus raptor and between 30 and 40% with basogram alone, whereas Mark barely got out of the 20s. There's a good reason for this. If you remember last July, uh, we had a lot of rainfall and we planted our snap bean trial in late June and we had significant amounts of rainfall. Uh, and what happened is, is our plants got injured by the herbicide, but they also got injured by the amount of water that we had in our field. And they were injured and they just never caught back up. This was compounding stresses and they just never grew out of it. And ultimately this injury that we observed resulted in about a 25% yield loss uh, in the number of marketable snap beans um, for our site across all of our herbicides. So herbicides are important for managing weeds in the field and spe uh, specialty crops, but they also cause injury which can reduce yields. Sometimes that herbicide injury comes from applications that are made outside of the field, maybe uh, on adjacent fields. Last year, I got calls about mesotrion, glyphosate, and dicamba uh, drift on snap beans. Uh, and dose, the amount of herbicide that, that uh, the crop comes into contact with and the timing of the contact is really going to influence injury and yield. Some injury can come from the labeled herbicides applied in the crops themselves. And this can significantly be influenced by timing, the crop development stage, but the weather and the environment at the time or near application. Again, compounding stresses, you can have one stress and then another stress that adds to it. Just so you know, for our 2022 research plans, we're gonna be screening for bentazon resistance uh, in our lambs quarters. We're gonna be partnering with Rutgers and Delaware for carryover and additional drift trials. 
We're evaluating a new novel herbicide valuation that we're hoping uh, for control of pigweeds and lambs quarters. And we're gonna be doing some competition trials and um, kind of melding our timing studies to look at the timing of uh, volunteer pea control in snap beans. And thank you very much to the people and organizations who sponsored the research. Very good. Thanks a lot. So no, thanks for the opportunity to talk here. Um, so this is sort of a familiar topic, but it's a tricky one to deal with. Uh, Lynn showed the, the orca traveling down the street in New York. Uh, great conditions for getting good bean root rot. Um, so we're going to have root rot. There's, there's no getting around it, but how do you make it less bad? And so for those of you, few of you unfamiliar with bean root rot, um, there's a whole bunch of different organisms that cause bean root rot. Fusarium and Pythium are probably the most common ones. Um, the presentation of the disease is a little bit different with each one. Um, but my simple-minded approach to it is that most of these are there all the time. So you have inoculum no matter what you do. You just want to keep the population of the inoculum as low as possible, avoid infection conditions, and keep the beans happy so that they're growing well. That's really the best you can do. Thankfully, cover crops can be very helpful for achieving those goals. Um, so when we think about uh, growing our beans, so on the left there, we see um, that we want to have a fairly uh, flat surface so that we can get those beans. Ideally, they would not actually be touching the ground, then you're going to get pod rot. But um, there's really not a lot of space in between there. It's easy to get splashing. Um, but we want to keep that surface flat so that the, the harvester can come through and pick those beans up. So that has implications for how we manage the surface of the soil. Um, so one of the, you know, if you want good infiltration, uh, you don't want compaction. Um, but we have some good devices for creating compaction in bean fields, particularly during harvest. Uh, particularly if it's a little wet during harvest. There's, you can't wait another day or two for the field to dry out or the beans will be so over mature, they're not useful. So this is a, a challenging call to make. Um, you, if you go, in, go into a wet field to harvest, you are expecting to have more root rot in the future. There's just no getting around it. But we can counteract that a little bit. Uh, so one of the important points to make about cover crops is if you really want the cover crop advantage, you also have to reduce tillage. So I have a figure here, this is from Tennessee, where they were doing um, two different winter cover crop treatments and compared to fallow. And the, it shows what the infiltration rate is. So when you have a heavy rain, how, how quickly does the, or how much water can you get rid of um, in the first several hours? And in the tilled ground, the cover crops really didn't have that much effect. It went from like an inch and a half of infiltration to about two inches of infiltration. So it, it mattered, but it wasn't great. If they reduced the tillage, and that's all they did, they got a similar effect. So from an inch and a half to two and a half, but they combine that with the cover crops. So and now the cover crop can do its work on improving infiltration. Now they were getting five inches of infiltration. And since we have rainfall events now of four inches or so, um, the difference between having two and a half inches of infiltration capacity and five is enormous. Um, but how do you do that in a, in a bean rotation? So on the left, I've just done a little schematic of something, uh, a reduced tillage system uh, that uh, is actually, it's working for some bean farmers in New York. The, um, having uh, the GPS guided uh, steering so you can hit these slots uh, is useful. But the idea is to have the lighter colored areas is the tilled zone and the darker colored areas are the untilled zone. So this is with the deep zone tillage uh, tool. Uh, the darker area now has a place for the roots to stay, to decompose, for the worms to go. 
for all those things that generate infiltration, they have a place to continue doing that. You're not destroying all the infrastructure every time you till. Um, so anything you can do to reduce that tillage um, in a zone. So it's not gentler tillage. You're not going from mold board chisel or anything like that. It's leaving some parts of it untilled is the key. Um, in this one, I've also drawn in a lighter color on the surface that um, for growing beans, you do have to incorporate residue or cultivate or something. So having a little layer of soil on top that does get cultivated is fine. The key is to leave those big blocks of untilled soil uh, as best you can. So it's, it's something that is happening in New York. I don't think the adoption is huge, but I think there's a lot of value to going there. And this is showing what happens when you get the soil aggregation. We've got um, the crumb allows, you can see that there's opportunity for infiltration, also for absorption of water into those aggregates. So it's not free water that's letting the pathogens grow. Um, and this is what it looks like when you have no-till. Um, this is just a couple of years of soil that was untilled. And we're basically doing what I diagrammed before. And um, those of you familiar with the vegetable research farm, that we've got a very high potential silt loam soil that if you beat it to pieces, it will form concrete very nicely. Um, and sometimes when we do research, we beat it to pieces. So this is what I started with and uh, what I ended up with. And you can see there's quite a few big holes there. Those are actually where worms live. There's some small holes where the roots have been and there's some little roots sticking out the bottom too. Um, so you're getting um, holes infiltration in a structure um, that will support heavier equipment as well. So you're um, you have the potential to do less compaction with this method also. And forming the aggregates, they're in all different sizes. So here shows the different scales of the aggregates. So the, the macro aggregates are really the roots and the hyphae that are forming those. Um, the micro aggregates, um, you're down to your uh, fungi in large part are forming those. Um, and to show what that really looks like in action. So this is... In the middle, you see a root, and around it, you see soil particles of various sizes and detritus of various things. Um, and this is what a root looks, the soil sheath looks like. It's glued together. Those are aggregates that are formed. This root was washed with water before they took the micrograph. So this is what does not wash off. It's pretty good glue. And as you can see, it's a nice aggregate, all different sizes of things in there, and makes a nice big particle that goes on to the last for a long time. Um, those make the tillage easier and uh, makes the water run away or get absorbed so that your root rot pathogens don't have as good a chance and your uh, beans are healthier. So I'm going to talk about some specific cover crops now uh, that can be helpful. So um, I think quite a few people have tried uh, tillage radish. Um, as a cover crop uh, and it behaves pretty nicely. Um, but for getting at the pathogens that cause root rot, rapeseed is actually better. Um, it produces more of the suppressive compounds in the roots. Um, this is what it looks like after um, we've had a freeze. So it's starting to die down. Um, all this green stuff is protein that's going to decompose during the course of the winter and into the springtime. Uh, the roots are really where the action is. The roots are already right up next to your pathogens. And so when the roots die and um, the glucosinolates break down, they kill the pathogens and reduce those populations. Uh, this is a uh, uh, brown mustard. So there's a couple of varieties, Pacific Gold and Caliente. They also stay relatively low. You just have a little bit of a stem on these, so it dies easily during the winter. But they've been bred for high glucosinolates, so they're more effective. In some other climates, it makes sense to do these as a 
as a plow down, but in our climate, that really doesn't end up making sense. Relying on the roots makes more sense. And so this is what you want it to look like in the beginning of March. So just about now, when the snow melts on the fields, this is roughly what your brown mustard should look like. So they have, the dying roots have released the toxic gas next to the pathogens. So you see you've reduced tillage, you've killed the pathogens, you have roots in there that are improving the percolation. So all of the things you're looking for are happening here. And the only thing that's happened is that you've planted the mustard seed. Uh, it's a pretty good deal. So that uh, is sort of the, num the number one cover crop approach. Um, and the mustards for Western New York, it's really the, the 10th to the 20th of August is really the sweet spot for planting these. You get good growth, you get um, no seed production, um, deep rooting. So that's the ideal. Um, but you can go to the very beginning of September. You get um, about a third of the biomass compared to a mid-August. So it's, you take a big hit on the biomass, but it's still um, worthwhile that late. Um, the classic that people use, winter rye, um, definitely helpful for maintaining infiltrate, infiltration, um, having the soil uh, dry out better. Um, so this, this is triticale. I like triticale because it actually has a, a noticeably stronger root system than rye, and the roots are where the action is, right? Um, so we like that. You can see on the very right how big um, so that's a two and a half deep root system on rye that has not started to bolt very much yet. Um, but if you're growing beans, of course, you want to terminate it early. So the rye in this picture is probably a little bit on the big side. There are no stems. You definitely want to terminate it before the stems if you're going to prepare uh, a seed bed that is suitable for beans. Uh, definitely a, a good practice here. Um, Sudan grass is also really good at improving percolation and at suppressing uh, root rot pathogens. However, it leaves so much residue and such a big crown that you can't realistically plant and harvest beans uh, immediately after a Sudan grass cover crop. Uh, so it would have to be uh, in a year before or following uh, the snap beans, um, having it in the rotation somewhere is definitely good. Um, but I would not put that one uh, right before the beans or it will be a huge headache in the springtime. Um, so what don't you do? Legumes. Legumes are great hosts for bean root rot pathogens. And so um, following uh, clover or vetch, uh, root rot would typically be about twice as bad as if you didn't have them uh, in your beans. So uh, legumes have an important place in the overall rotation, but not preceding beans. So you probably knew that one already, but I thought I'd throw it in there. Uh, so the key, reducing root rot. So the, the pathogens are always there. Um, can't get around that. You want to reduce their population to the extent you can. Um, you want to make sure that you have as much infiltration in the soil uh, as possible and water holding in the soil as possible. And you want to keep your uh, beans as happy as possible. And um, yeah, they don't like hypoxia. I think we, <laughs> Alan Taylor showed how unhappy they are uh, when they don't get oxygen. Uh, and yeah, Lynn showed what the, that they don't grow out of the herbicide effects either. Uh, so percolation and water holding, super important when growing beans. Um, so what are the practices? Reducing traffic, controlling traffic. I think the, um, the move to uh, GPS controlled tractors and controlled traffic in um, large scale, uh, vegetable production is fantastic. We're in effect doing permanent beds there. It has huge benefits. Um, 
thinking about reducing the tillage volume rather than the tillage intensity is probably useful because those untilled areas are the ones that develop um, all of the holes, all of the support structures um, for equipment. Um, it's a big change to do that, uh, but it seems to be paying off well in New York. And then use the cover crop. So the, the usual um, winter grain over the winter, but terminated early, we're using the crucifer cover crops in the fall, having them winter kill so that it leaves the soil surface in a good condition uh, for planting and harvesting beans. So that's where I'm gonna finish up mine. Thank you, Thomas. Any questions for Thomas? And, and I see Lynn and Alan are still here as well. Yeah. So if you have any questions for them, feel free. And I've got, I see there's people like Don Sweet and Roger Ward on here who, who know this stuff. What's going to make this, these things, uh, where, where are these techniques likely to be implementable for snap bean growers that you work with? I'd be keen to hear that. I think overall the use of cover crops and, and a lot of this has improved, but in processing vegetables, still some you've got the, you know, we step in and break some of the tillage practices mm -hmm. that they're using for other crops. When you mm -hmm. get to peas and snap beans, a lot of the things you want to do with zone tillage or strip, mm -hmm. you know, we're kind of the odd link with <laughs> whether it's peas, some, I mean, beans, right. we're doing some zone till or some strip tilling with. Yeah. Um, but most of it's all of you need a, more of a clean tillage type thing to reduce right. the you know, contaminant side of things. So. Right. I like to see some more um, like those uh, mustard uh, cover crops and some of that. Um, some places, though, they just don't fit in depending, depending on what the rotation is on right. some of these farms. But um, in some of the places where they, where they could, um, that looks like a, a great opportunity. And one of the nice things about vegetable rotations is that uh, you're harvesting a lot of the season. So there's a lot more opportunities to put in a cover crop than there is for the field crops. Um, and taking advantage of that um, soon after harvest is possible, I think can really pay off. And the focus on, the, on what the roots are doing it, um, allows you to think about the the needed clean tillage, which is so important for snap beans. And I think a, a detraction for using cover crops um, where the, if you think the shoot, the shoot part of the cover crop has to be handled a certain way. If you let the roots do the work, deal with the shoot independently in a way that's best for the snap beans. And I think that may provide a little bit of an um, extra latitude um, where you, and so the normal practices don't don't let you grow the snap beans afterwards. Do you have any idea what the cost is for some of those uh, different uh, cover crops the, per acre? Yeah, the crucifers are still running three or four dollars a pound typically, um, and um, five to seven pounds an acre is a good target uh, amount okay. of plant. So it's it's not too bad. Everything else seems to have gone up, but those, those remain a pretty good bargain. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.